22nd of December 2017, and this is the uh, Vancouver meeting of the Society for the New Humanist Paradigm, and I'm Paul Gomez. So tonight's meeting is, is more of a battle report than anything else. And this is the battle over the future disposition of the human race. On the one side, you have what Xi Jinping has called the shared common destiny of the full economic development of the world and of the human species. On the other side, you have a demoralizing, evil, anti-human system run by an oligarchy that wants to perpetuate and uh, an unperpetuatable system of permanent wars, depopulation, and most of all, the destruction of the inner potential creative beauty of the human species, of the individuals in the human species. And it is the horribleness of this evil which is forcing the emergence of a much more powerful good. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through the context briefly. So basically, Lynn's breakthrough in economics and what was emerging in the 50s and 1960s to, uh, projected into the future to, mis to, to Mr. LaRouche meant the destruction of the human race. And he created a, a, a beginnings of a movement to try to deal with this. And he didn't have a lot to work with. It was the, it was the 1968 or generation. And from the late 1960s, and especially from the late 1970s, this movement uh, counterposed all the direct, uh, all the um, these these policies that were that LaRouche could see coming in the 50s and, and the 60s. And over that period of time, forces that emerged to support LaRouche's policies, whether it was Indira Gandhi in India or Lopez Portillo in Mexico, or uh, or even those individuals around Ronald Reagan and later Clinton. They were all crushed. And we were crushed again and again and again. And during the 16 years of Obama and Bush after 9-11, the world was treading towards the end of the human race. If Russia and China did not surrender or were altered through color revolutions, then they were being set up for uh, a first nuclear strike. That's what all this uh, positioning of ABM systems on, on both sides. And that is what we have been uh, living in, the terror of that since 9-11, and all of the things that were going on since then. But none of this was really lost to the leadership of most of the world. What to do about it? A new global system of interconnected cooperative development had to emerge to replace this evil system and also be, have the capacity to heal the wounds that this evil system has created and then go forward. And this is what this movement kept alive for 40 years. And the siren song I heard every every week from people in the street, you know, why are you doing this? It's hopeless. You know, why why, why bother? You're not gonna be able to do it. Um, my esteemed professor of anthropology, Marvin Harris, who I was supposed to to uh, be uh, be a protege of, when he when I, I sent him a letter one time telling what had happened to me, and I'd become a, a activist in this movement. He wrote back to me, said, I, I know um, Linda Rouge very well. I know what he's trying to do. And if you ever come close, you and he will be dead. And, 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 and there's nothing you can do. Fascism is coming. It will take over the world. It's inherent in, in the way things are. And the best thing you can do is grab a little perch like me. And, and, and right, right, basically. So, so, but this, this, and, and this is always the the way 
when we were coming under attack from the uh, from the Justice Department and the FBI and Robert Mueller was organ was organizing it, they would say to us, you know, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, you know, what do you get out of it? What are you going to get out of this? You know, you know, you're not getting any any pension for doing this. And 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 this will be always be, be you know, there's nothing you can do. This is the way it is. However, that's not what happened. And I believe that we laid the groundwork to all these years. And people were paying, some people were paying attention. But it was only very recently that they decided to move, to put forward a new system. And, and put forward a new system with institutional and state power that we as individuals did not have. We as a small group did not have. So, so now I'm going to go into the next aspect of this. Leadership is very important. Leadership is very important. If they tell you, in our culture, if you assert, your, if you assert leadership, you get hit very hard. No, you're not respecting my opinion. Oh, or whatever. It's just very hard to be a leader. You're always going to offend somebody and, and you can't do that. And, it's very hard to have leadership in this culture, to be an actual leader. And when you are, and when you demonstrate actual leadership, you get hit with it. You get hit hard. You get hit by everybody. Everybody attacks you. Nobody likes you. Uh, so it happened. Uh, in 2012, uh, a new uh, leader was brought to power in China. Um, Xi Jinping, and uh, he announced when he took the position, and he was conf before the uh, several audience of his nation. He announced a Chinese dream, and that was in 2012. And China was very vulnerable in that period. You know, Deng had uh, dealt with the problem of. The, of the Cultural Revolution and had begun opening up China to, to the West and to development. And it was very difficult because they had to, you know, um, set up these free trade zones and all the world would come in and, and, and exploit cheap labor. And they, were, they, were, they knew what they were doing. They, you're you're going to exploit our cheap labor so we can get the currency to, to start developing. They knew what they were doing. But it wasn't the best thing. But nonetheless, they did it because there was no other option. They didn't have a capability. They weren't. They didn't have development. They had to have development. So they sacrificed to get that development. And uh, now, so during the period from 1978 when they consolidated power to 2012, China developed a lot, and there was a gradual slope creeping. But at the same time that they were developing, there was a black, gradual slope creeping corruption emerging in the Communist Party. And because the Communist Party was the only organization that was the guy, that was the government. The Communist Party was the organization, and uh, it, it was permeated. And you began to have communist billionaires and communist millionaires, and and all kinds of people were 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 stocking away and having relatives overseas, you know, putting bank accounts overseas, secret accounts in the British offshore system. And, and so on and so forth. And people were being told, hey, you know, the poor people would come to get services, and well, you know how that works, right? In a poor country, well, you gotta pay a little bit to get the services. So they had they had a system called the red envelope. Where you put a little money in the red envelope and you get from whatever envelope. It's a red envelope because it's communist, but but it's not necessarily a red color envelope. And then you give the little red envelope or whatever envelope it is to the, to the official and then you get whatever you need. And people resented this tremendously. The population tremendously resented this and there was a lot of complaints. But that's the party. That's the system. How are you going to, you're just the people. What are you, you know, you're going to rise up and overthrow the, overthrow the government over this, you know. But the people and the Communist Party were drifting apart. And the Communist Party was becoming more and more just people um, you 
know, sloganeering and stuff like that. You know, we all hear sloganeering. Now, what Xi Jinping did immediately after coming in is he did something incredibly difficult, incredibly spectacular, and not understood in the West. He launched the most massive, thorough, anti-corruption campaign the world has ever seen. Somewhere on the order of one and a half million party members were disciplined. And it didn't matter whether it was at the village level or if it was at the national level, they went through a whole system. They put most of these people under uh, surveillance and they put them under, um, I guess you could say, some kind of, uh, they would have to, you know, go through this. And I have reports that prior to this, there would be all these fa fancy restaurants and all of the people with, with money hide away would go out and have a good time in these very expensive restaurants. And then I was told that after this, it would, these restaurants all went bankrupt because it, cause that, it changed. It, it seriously changed. And now, now Hillary just made a statement attacking uh, this consolidation of power. The, the media in the West is saying that what, what he has done is, what, what uh, Xi Jinping has done is got rid of his enemies. Well, that's partly true. If you <laughs> your enemy, <laughs> then if you, you have to do that, right? Now, so this is why he has 90% popularity in the population, because when the party, because what's changed is the following. And this is the, this is the huge change that took place in China. And I don't think people have a clue to this, that what Xi Jinping has said, the party serves the people. The people don't serve the party. That's what, that's what happened. You need help, we're there to help you. Oh, you need help? No, that's gone. Imagine a population that has gone through something like that. Oh, the party really cares. Oh, I don't have to do that anymore. You have, you know, this guy is serious. This guy's for real. He actually did it. He actually made it happen. He kicked their butt so hard. And I was uh, reading through some of the Asian blogs, and I ran across this, this, uh, this, a number of entries, and it said, Xi Jinping is very angry at the youth leadership. The, the communist youth movement. He is saying they're doing nothing but sloganeering. They don't care about art, history, or poetry. Whoa. That's something, that's not, that's a, he's telling them that they are, that they are, that they're just sloganeering. They're not, they're not developing their minds, they're not developing the youth. So he has, he, so I'm saying this because the one, the Belt and Road Initiative could not be launched and it would have no reality to it if this individual had allowed for the corruption in the society to, to continue. So when they put him on the same stage as Mao and Deng Xiaoping, that's what it means. It means this guy is making a profound, profound, profound change in Chinese society, and, in, and, and Mao made some profound changes too, but they weren't necessarily very good. But, and Deng made profound changes as well. And this guy is making profound changes in Chinese society. So, now the West is complaining that this is the consolidation of a dictatorship, and you know, he, you know, people don't have rights and all of that, right? But having the right, 
having the right not to have to get well, put money in the red envelope is a, is a pretty significant right, I think. <laughs> and uh, but that was not enough. Just cracking down on a bunch of corrupt party bureaucrats, whether they be small or large, does not solve your problem. You have to give the nation a vision. And that's what, the, that's what Xi Jinping has done. He's put forward a vision of a future for China as a whole and for the entire world as a whole. And by doing so, he's able to create a moral a moral sense in the population that, that they are contributing to something and as opposed to just looking out for me, just opposed to just looking out for number one, because that's, that's the ultimate beginnings of any corruption in any system is, hey, look out for number one. I am looking out for number one. That's the beginning of everything. So if you don't have a sense that you're actually contributing to something that is that has that's that's good and that has a future and that's going to be good for everybody then you're not going to have that moral strength to resist the the individual uh, uh, tendencies but those individual tendencies are worse when you have a demoralized population when you have a de de degenerate population when you have a demoralized population then it is, you know, I'm just going to look out for number one. That's, that's all I can do is look out for number one. Now, some four and a half years later, the whole nation, coming out of the 19th uh, Party Congress, the whole nation, and it's also infecting all the overseas Chinese in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, all the diplomats, all the business layers, all the commercial layers, all the bankers are uh, connected to China. This vision is starting to infect them. And they are saying this idea of a, of, of a community of shared destiny is. But it's the Belt and Road Initiative which puts in the physical reality behind it, because otherwise it would all be platitudes. All of this would be platitudes. But the Belt and Road is the physical transformation of the economy that raises everybody up. And without that, it would all be platitudes. But without this crackdown on corruption, he wouldn't have the, the moral authority. You do not have a moral authority to demand that the world unite around a common benefit your policy. You can't take care of your corruption at home. Okay, that's, that's a key concept here. Now, Putin and Russia have joined this vision. Russia can't do it on its own. It only has 150 million people, and, and those people are not all in the best shape. They've been through, you know, a lot. Uh, I won't get into all the details, but nonetheless, they have a, they have a competent leader who is working with, with uh, Xi Jinping and have provided a crucial diplomatic and military um, uh, back to, to all of this. So I, I say this to give you the con a bit of a context of what I'm going to say next. Because you have to get a sense of, that this, of what is happening now. Now this is basically a, se a several weeks report of what's actually happened. So you get the sense of motion that we're talking about. And this is in the wake of the visit by Trump. Um, in the wake of the visit by Trump in the U.S., you have all these states led by West Virginia making all these deals with China. Today, we have the mayor of Houston going to get deals for Texas the whole entourage. Um, in this same period, we had a conference in Budapest, Hungary, the 16 plus one. These are 16 uh, European 
Central European and Eastern European nations. Not all are in the EU, but most are in the EU. And they had a conference in Budapest. And this is a, this is a yearly conference. And the, and the 16 plus 1, the 1 is China. And it's, Ch it's China having this conference with all these nations to promote uh, economic development. Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, announced before the conference that the center of the world is shifting to the Pacific. That is, the center of the world is not the Atlantic anymore. It's the Pacific, and that's where we have to orient. That's where our economies have to go. That's where we have to orient. And that is exactly the kind of thing that's going on. In the middle of all this, the European Union is trying to block Chinese infrastructural investment in, in, in Eastern Europe. They're trying to block the development rail corridor from Budapest to Serbia and from Serbia to Piraeus port in Greece and so forth. So the European Union as an entity with, it, with its own bureaucracy straddling across nations is trying to stop this. Then in the middle of all this we had our Schiller conference. And um, in the place near Frankfurt did, that uh, Rodney was talking about. And the, this conference had a large representation from France, from Middle East countries, from some African countries, uh, from some Eastern European nations. And the Chinese uh, speaker was a woman who was the head of the African uh, um, part of the Chinese um, Academy of Sciences, the uh, Academy of Social Sciences. Now the Academy of Social Sciences are the experts that, um, that do studies for, for the uh, leadership. And she is the leader of that. She's been very active in African policy. And she went into how it's the economic development in Africa that will begin to transform the involvement of individuals in the, in the development from a, a tribal, like primarily tribal identity to a, not an anti-tribal identity, but a tribal identity, but, but a, also a working class identity. And that when you make that transition from a tribal to a working class identity, you actually begin to identify more closely with the nation as a whole, as opposed to just with, with your um, tribe. And she didn't say this at the conference. She said this uh, a few days later on, on, on CCTV. But it's important to understand that the Chinese view of what they're doing is they're not going to go in and resolve the internal conflicts, but rather to, the, to whatever degree they can get people working and getting these projects going, that that process itself will create the conditions for, for resolving a lot of the issues. Because if you don't have that transition to, a, to a, an economic development orientation, you're not going to be able to resolve these issues. Now, the way it usually works with, with, the, with the IMF and the World Bank and all of these people is we're not going to invest in that area because it's too unstable. Therefore, we're going to saddle them with debt and squeeze. We're bankers. We can't invest 20 years in, in, uh, before we get a full return. You know? But the Chinese aren't doing it. They're investing because they expect to get a return in 20 years and not a monetary return. They expect to have a huge return in 20 years because Africa is, is a place they can develop very fast. And, 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 and so forth. And Africa has incredible potential for agricultural and other, you know, you're going to get your biggest bang for the buck in terms of development in Africa. But in the long term, and in the medium term. So, so now, also at the Schiller Conference, we had uh, we had a friend from Yemen put in a video 
Uh, Siobhan, the woman who was uh, uh, the personal um, assistant to, uh, to Bashir Assad, uh, was planning to come in person and to address the conference, but she didn't, she couldn't, she had to go to China uh, instead. And, and on that note, there's a lot happening with, with Syria and China and Russia. And I'll get into that, I might get into that a little bit later on. So, uh, so this conference also went into the scientific issues. It also went into the, um, the, the development issues. Uh, you can get more of that from the, uh, from the website. Um, but at the same time, or a little bit uh, thereafter, there was also another conference in Paris a few days later with 400 attendees. And this was the establishment of the first annual forum on the Belt and Road Initiative in France, sponsored by the Chinese Embassy and the third largest think tank uh, called the French Institute for International Strategic Affairs. And the people represented were heads of companies, think tanks, and so forth. Now, Jacques Cherminard, who is, a, who is the, our leader in France, who ran for president of France, has had extensive discussions with the Belt and Road with a lot of the leadership including the former uh, president uh, of, of France. And the former prime minister of France, Ralph Aran, was, was in China for the Belt and Road uh, Conference. And, and there, is a, there is a shift going on in the, in the elite and in the leadership of France about whether to, to go way in to the, to the Belt and Road. And, and Jacques' message to all these uh, leaders, all of these top people, because he ran for president and he's coming, he comes from the right school, you know, even though uh, he, he has access, and he's telling them, the center has shifted to the Pacific, you must shift also. At the same time, there was the 11th summit uh, of China, Latin American, Caribbean business summit in Uruguay. And this is a much more significant than the other 10. There were 2,500 people there. And then the entire um, plenary session was devoted to incorporating all of these nations into the Belt and Road Initiative. Then you have the president of Chile, uh, Bachelet who, on November 23rd, spoke at the 10th anniversary of the Confucius Institute, which is a cultural institute, they also promote Chinese. And I'll quote her. The world is orienting more than ever towards China and the Pacific Basin. Therefore, we know very well that our relationship with China, and the Asia Pacific in particular, is crucial for us to fulfill our destiny. Chile's relationship with China goes well beyond trade ties. It is one of our primary political partners on the path to opening, integrating, and cooperating for progress. And then she mentioned that upon retirement, she tends to study the Chinese language in, in greater depth. Now we also have an unconfirmed report that we should be getting more on later on. That the, Jap that, that the Japanese are now negotiating with the Chinese to bring the major Japanese firms into the construction projects on the Belt and Road. So basically, the Japanese are being uh, are being uh, are, are about to join um, with China in these construction efforts. Now you got to understand, China and Japan do not have the warmest of feelings towards each other, for given what Japan did to China during the World War II, and all of the things. And also, they, they have a hard time with the Japanese because they, they still haven't apologized for it. <laughs> uh, Korea's even more. <laughs> yeah, Korea's even more. So, however, this is about to take place. Now, at the same time, President Xi opened in Beijing a Communist Party 
of China dialogue with world political parties. This is the first time I believe this has happened. 300 political parties from nations all over the world, 120 nations, with 600 representatives came. And she explained to them that with the Belt and Road Initiative, he was introducing a new model of relationship between nations and peoples, a model oriented to the well-being of all nations and all peoples. And to add to this, he wished to, to promote a new model for party-to-party -party relationships. In other words, all political parties can have a dialogue with the Chinese political party on a party-to-party -party basis. However, China will never import foreign models of development nor export the Chinese model. We're not interested in telling you how to do it. But we want to work with you. We'll work with you. And over the next five years, he would like to, to invite 15,000 members of foreign political parties to come to China for exchanges. There was a representative from the Democratic Party of the United States and the Republican Party of the United States. And we are waiting to hear their response. <laughs> This is yeah. Okay. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> okay. Now, after the conference, Helco was after the conference last week. Helco was suspiciously silent. Well, she had gone to China, to Zhuhai, near Macau, to participate in the 21st century. Maritime Silk Road Forum as a speaker. And I think she, she got back yesterday or the day before yesterday. So this is just the level of action that's going on and, and the level of, this is just the public side of it. This is for, this is all out, folks. This is all out. This is not, they're not playing around. This is, they, they know this thing has to be consolidated. People have to buy into it. The more they buy into it, the less chance we have of a, 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 a world war. The more we have a chance for peace, the more we have a chance. So now, we come to the battle inside the US, which is getting very nasty. And um, the the circus goes on. Huh? The circus goes on. The what? Circus. 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 It's, it's not. It's, it's, it's much worse than that. <laughs> um, it's not just a circus. It's, it's much worse. Um, Say degradation. Um, so first, I'll deal with the Flynn issue, the Michael Flynn uh, issue, and I want to read you the short report by uh, our Barbara Boyd, who is the treasurer of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, but she's also been the one that's been most following all of the, all of the, this kind of stuff that's been going on. And so I'm going to read her, uh, her, her report because I, I can't put it all together. There's so many parts. So she put it together, and I'm going to read her report. Okay. As the media and their reporters have gone into their usual fever and frenzy, slobbering over the potential of taking down the President of the United States, it is important to situate for the membership exactly what the Flynn plea means. It represents Mueller's counterpunch to growing momentum from the House Intelligence Committee and the courts to fully reveal the British hand in this coup, centered in the phony Steele dossier and its uh, adoption by Obama and his criminal uh, conspirators as the instrument to destroy the Trump presidency. It occurs in the wake of the president's enormously successful visit to China and conversations with President Putin. 
It occurs as the House Intelligence Committee is contemplating contempt proceedings against the FBI and the Department of Justice for failure to disclose how the Steele dossier was used to instigate the illegal investigations into the Trump campaign by the FBI. In a hearing on Thursday before U.S. District Judge Richard Leon, the judge had also indicated that he thought most of Fusion GPS's claim rights to protect bank records regarding payments related to the Steele dossier were bogus. The bank records are sought by the House Intelligence Committee. Michael Flynn was fired by President Trump for providing a false account of his conversations with Russian Ambassador Kislyak to Vice President Pence. Among others in the Trump administration, uh, Pence, among others in the Trump administration, the immediate sequence of incidents leading to his firing arose when his name was literally unmasked by Obama administration's officials in a, uh, when his name was illegally unmasked by Obama administration officials as a result of the NSA surveillance. Flynn, however, was already a target, having been fired for dissing Obama when Flynn was head of the Defense Intelligence Agency and drawing the attention of the British for his attendance at a banquet for RT and his calls for collaboration with Russia in the war on terror, particularly Syria. After un unmasking Flynn's conversations with Kislyak, holdover Obama Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates raced over to the White House to claim that since Flynn had lied about his conversations with Kislyak, and since the Russians knew what was actually said, the Russians had completely compromised Trump's national security uh, advisor. Yates' insane demand that Flynn be fired on this basis was leaked to the news media, and in the atmosphere of media hysteria, Flynn agreed to an interview with the FBI in the White House on January 24, 2017. No lawyer was present. A perfect setup. Since that time, Flynn and his son have been investigated to death by Mueller in an effort to concoct criminal offenses uh, uh, amongst them is the bizarre claim by the uh, neocon James Woolsey that Flynn and company were conspiring to kidnap Fatula Gulen and return him to Turkey for a million dollar fee. Flynn has incurred huge legal fees from the from the hoity-toity Washington firm Covington and Berlin. His lead lawyer, Robert Kellner, publicly signed the Never Trumps movement and hates the president. Various articles about the deal point out that Flynn was deeply dismayed by the prospect of his son spending years in prison and about his family being bankrupted by his enormous legal fees. According to his plea book, uh, agreement, Flynn lied to the FBI in a, his interview on January 24, 2017, about conversations he had with Kislyak about the Russian response to Obama's December 28, 2016, imposition of sanctions for alleged Russian interference in the 2016 election. In reality, according to the uh, plea agreement, Kislyak contacted Flynn on the day the sanctions were imposed Posed, and Flynn asked the Russians not to escalate the situation. Kislyak reported back to Flynn that the Russians would follow Flynn's advice. Flynn discussed these conversations about Obama's sanctions with senior members of the Trump administration then. An alleged false statement in, to, in the same FBI interview concerning Flynn's conversations with the Russians, among other nations, concerning a December 21st, 2016 vote in the UN about Israeli settlements. settlements. Flynn asked the Russians, among others, to delay the vote or delay the re resolution. It is to be emphasized that there was nothing illegal in any of these contests. Flynn was charged with lying or omitting material facts when he spoke to the FBI about them. It is also obviously relevant that the entire premise for Obama's sanctions was fake, since we now know that there was no Russian hacking of the election. Finally, Flynn pled to making false 
statements in his Foreign Intelligence, Foreign Agents Registration Act statement about his lobbying activities on behalf of Turkey. This is also Mueller's new favorite toy, stretching the use of the vague statute, formerly, uh, formerly famous for voluntary civil compliance only. Our robot Torquemada, Robert Mueller, has decided to turn the Foreign Agents Registration Act into a criminal bludgeon. Thus, as we have said in the Mueller dossier, we face the criminalization of political policy differences and crimes uh, manufactured as a result of lies told under incredible duress. Sounds like a banana republic, doesn't it? As Alan Dershowitz said in the reaction to the news that Flynn was cooperating with Mueller, now it is the highly probable that General Flynn will lie like crazy to realize the no, no, no jail time for promise of his plea agreement. Rule of law, give me a break. The population should be up in arms about this. Mueller must be stopped. So um, we're, we're launching, we're expanding our mobilization uh, on Mueller into the U.S. population. Um, we're, we're on a fundraising drive to, to, uh, to print more of the pamphlets to circulate. And uh, so, uh, now, something else has been going on that I wrote an article on in the previous EIR, um, that on October 26th, uh, Trump uh, began a war on drugs. And this is very serious. It is not being reported in the, in the media. And what has happened in the United States, and it's also happening in Canada, it's different in Canada, but it's, it's happened in the United States. The massive increase in opioid addiction is coming about through the doctor's office, not anymore as much through the streets. What is happening is that there's been a, a, a decade and a half, decade long campaign and part of this is connected to the Obama care bill, where to make the issue of pain a big issue for treatment. You have pain, well, so what? You're not going to die. Well, you have pain. We got to treat you. And so, and then the, the, this grouping of this pharmaceutical family that developed OxyContin has spent a lot of money and worked with the, with the well, they own now, they own one of the major pharma, uh, pharma companies, <coughs> Indiana Pharma or, or one of those, one of those pharma companies. And so they, they've been pushing for doctors to, to prescribe these uh, opioids. And they've been mis mis misrepresenting and they got the salesmen in all the offices and they've been just, it's been hammering away at this for many, for, for this period. So what's happened is you've had a massive opioid addiction increase. And when people can no longer have these drugs, they go to the street for the heroin, which is a lot cheaper at this time than the prescription drugs. And so you have this massive... And then fentanyl somehow brought, is somehow being laid. A lot of the drugs are being laced with fentanyl to increase the, 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 the strength of the addiction. So fentanyl is the drug that is used to increase um, the, uh, the strength of the addition. And it's also being used as well. It's also being prescribed. And so a national health emergency was declared. The NIH, National Institute of Health, and the private sector are being told by Trump to mobilize to come up with non-opioid painkillers. And um, but in the meantime, the pharmaceutical companies, through their efforts, had, had, on this basis, had gotten a law passed in 2016, which deregulated the, the enforcement of, of their, uh, and, and made the, the pharmaceutical companies more the enforcer. So this allowed for massive quantities of these opioids to go out to the street without the power of the, uh, the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency being able to interdict, interdict those things. And of course, the Obama and DEA has been very soft and very lax with respect to all of this. So, so that situation 
um, is a very serious one. Now, he also discussed going after the gangs, uh, working with the Mexican government to shut down the drug cartels and shut down um, uh, and work with all nations to shut down the, the, the production and the cartels. And he also talked about changing the culture. Uh, and But you have to understand where things stand. The drug thing has reached an incredible uh, uh, negative turning point and something needs to be done. And what happened under Obama is that the, the Mexican drug cartels were using a loophole in the, uh, in the election law using credit cards, donations, anonymous credit card donations to massively flood the campaign coffers of, 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 of uh, Obama and, and, and Hillary, okay? And especially Obama, particularly the 2008 election. And, uh, and th there's very clear evidence that the, that the Mexican cartels were, um, the Obama administration was either either also this is fast and furious. We're also providing weapons for the for the Mexican cartel to use us to enforce their will on the Mexican people, but also not not being hard on the on the on the on the transport of, of weapons into Mexico to the cartels. Now the structure of this is is that you have um, you have according to the FBI thirty three thousand criminal gangs in the United States of varying uh, degrees in the prisons and in the streets. And that, um, um, and these are criminal gangs. Um, and not all of them push drugs, but um, the, the ones like the MS-13, the Mara Salvatucha gang, uh, is estimated to have six to 10,000 members in the United States, about 70,000 members um, in, in, in both in North, North and South America, I mean, in, in the Americas. And, and Trump had um, 1,600, 1,400 of these people rounded up, including a lot of leadership in a, in a six week period in May and April after there, there, there was these gruesome murders in, in, uh, in New York State. Now, that potential exists. Um, so all of this exists. Now, to, to understand Obama, okay, then you have George Soros coming in to legalize the drugs, legalize the marijuana. There's now a study has just come out that uh, significant marijuana use or heavy marijuana use uh, of, of teenagers has shown evidence that it leads to bipolar disorder later in, in life. They, this is, this is a, a report that just came out. But the legalization of drugs also carries with it a political, uh, a marijuana also carries with it a conception that a society doesn't have the right to tell people uh, they can't use drugs or they can't use whatever they want. And that means that a person who is permitted that a person could destroy themselves if they wanted to. It's up to them. And any society that has that view is 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 is, 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 is saying that it's, that that the effort that human, that the society has put into into that individual can be destroyed, and all the future and hopes and everything is okay to destroy that if that person decides to do that, or if that person gets on drugs or, or whatever. So this whole thing, this whole thing is is a, is a demoralizing, has an incredible demoralizing effect on society. So that's the cultural issue. Then we have the final one, which is um, people don't like to talk about it. And that Obama considered himself, or, and was considered to be the rapper in chief. Now, there's been a lot of promotion of rap music and the culture, but people don't really fully appreciate that that is the culture of the gangs. And, and, and that is the culture of rape. That is the culture of violence and um, rage and violence. That is the culture of, of subjugating women. And you never hear any, 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 um, any feminist attack this brutal, brutal culture. 
which is brutal. Which is if you live in a poor neighborhood and you're a woman, that you're in deep trouble. There's nothing you can do. You can go to the police if you want, but then you have to live in that neighborhood, and those people can, uh, you know, that kind of world is what people who are very, very poor, who live in those kind of neighborhoods, are subjected to. The terror and fear. And Obama was the rapper in chief. As if it was okay. As if this culture of violence and gangs was okay. And so this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the... And now the British always look at gangs as, a, as, a, as mediating structures. These are, these are um, a, a structures outside the law that control a people. And so they've always run things on based on um, criminal gangs, whether it's the Mafia or, or the Tongs or the Tangs in China or, or whatever. You know, this, is a how, this is how you undermine a country. This is how you, how you have uh, informal, informal forms of, of control. And that has to be shut down. So there is an indication that if the Trump administration continues, they will move in this direction in a very big way. And the person who is now, who was formerly Homeland Security head and is currently uh, Chief of Staff uh, General John Kelly, he is one of those people that uh, is very intimate with the situation and has indicated in a number of different interviews his understanding of the situation and that, and that they, they, they will begin to move. And this can't be done. Now, if the United States establishes normal relations with Russia, and has normal relations with China, then you can begin to evolve in the context of a Belt and Road situation, a, a, a cross-national effort on a massive scale to shut this all down. Whether it's the whether it's the um, getting you know getting shutting it all down in Afghanistan and giving these uh, farmers an alternative um, crop, or whether it's it's Whatever you have the political power to do this, and that is one of the unspoken potentials that exist in in, 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 in this administration. It, and we do know that there is a visceral hatred of the drug trade and the drug culture um, that we notice in this president. Uh, a visceral hatred of, of drugs and 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 and, and so forth. So. So, so that's, an, that's another area that's not being covered. The fact that this is going on is not being covered. So um, now, I want to uh, finish with one last thing. Um, in this context, you had a meeting in Sochi of Putin, uh, of the Assad process, I think it was in Sochi, of Putin, Erdogan. Erdogan, and, and I think uh, the president of Iran. 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 Now, Erdogan claims he's a Sunni, right? The president, is it Rouhani? The president of Shia. Right? Yeah, Shia. yeah. He, he claims he's a Shia. And Vladimir Putin claims he's Orthodox Christian. All right, you get the idea. You have an Orthodox Christian, a Sunni, and a Shia discussing uh, guaranteeing a, a, a stable peace process in Syria. How long will that hold? I hope it continues. And we might find out a little bit about that on Monday. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this is the battle report. And there are many battles to come, we hope. And it's not over. This is just the beginning. Because this, this great, profound evil has to be crushed. And it, it's not going to be crushed um, except through uh, a superior idea. So I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, I know, I know what's coming.